then this the part three will be the rounding up of the character of Christ. Not because we have exhausted it, uh, but so that we can do other things. It is hope that uh, it is hope that everybody rather can then study further personally. <clears throat> excuse me to understand better the character of Christ. We've been looking at the humanity of Christ, so to say, you know how he handled things daily, and uh, not necessarily going into his teachings but just looking at him as as a, a man as a minister of god as a human being like us how did they relate how did they live his day-to-day -day life how did they respond to people the same situation that we also could face today and we have been a little bit systematic by looking at the book of mark uh, today we will proceed from Mark uh, chapter 3. That's where we stop. We stop in Mark chapter 3 the last time. And so today we will just proceed further by looking at Mark chapter 3. And the first verse we'll be looking at there is verse 21. If you check your Bible and look at Mark chapter 3 verse 21, there's something interesting there. It says, and when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him. For they said, he is beside himself. Uh, which basically means something must be wrong with him. But I want you to note that these friends that they talk about, that's, that's what really interests me in this passage. These friends were not his disciples. The Bible isn't talking about the disciples of Jesus here. And it's quite interesting to note that Jesus had friends. Aside from having a um, disciple whom he called friend, uh, he also had friends the way you and I would have friends today. So in that verse 21, his friends... When they saw that he's been so busy with ministry work and so on, they're like, something must be wrong with this, our friend. Though. We better go and get him out of the place. You know, so the scripture says, when his friends heard of it. So Jesus Christ uh, made friends. But I want to check... Um, other translations of the scripture and just see how they describe some of those friends. New Living says, when his family heard about it. Uh, new, that's new NIV, sorry. New Living says, um, when his family heard it. Okay, so they regarded them as his family members, but clearly, they were a group of people that were different from his disciples or his regular uh, followers, that they feel that they could caution Jesus. In fact, they say he is out of his mind. So they felt they could caution him uh, and so on. So it's understandable at times if our friends, our family members uh, begin to feel like, um, why are you taking this thing this way? You know, Jesus also went through it. His own relative, his own family, his own friends felt like he must be out of his mind. How could you be so busy from morning till evening? Everybody wants to listen to you um, here and there. That is just looking at his humanity. Then when you look at verse 22 and 23, it says, And the scribe which came down from Jerusalem said, He had Beelzebub and the prince of the devil, and by the prince of the devil casted he out devils. Again, just like we noted the last time, Jesus was being accused here of using the power of Satan to do miracles. Now, how do you expect him to respond to this? Can you imagine that Christ was being accused 
of using the devil. The Bible, Jesus himself said, the devil came but found nothing in me. There was nothing of the devil in Christ, but they accused him of using the power of the devil. Did he get angry? Did they abuse them? What was his response? Verse 23. And he called them unto him and said unto them in parable, How can Satan cast out Satan? Can you see his response? He turned it into another teaching to help them understand that there is no way he will be defeating the kingdom of darkness and it will be the power of darkness that is being used uh, to do that. And you know, this is quite fundamental. I remember that when I was much younger, we used to watch some of these local uh, movies that has to do with fetish practices, witches and wizards. But usually they will portray someone to be a good person, but that person also is using the power of Satan. But he is sort of using it to defend people and so on. So they sold that kind of concept to us when we were much younger, that there is a good power of Satan. But there is nothing good about Satan. They are all they are all condemned. They are all under the flesh. So Jesus just took the occasion. He didn't get angry um, at people and begin to abuse them and so on. He just took the occasion to explain better to anybody who want to understand uh, why their assumption was not correct. So that's another thing we note about him. Then if we move to verse 31, you will again see uh, the role of his family. The Bible said, Then there came his brethren and his mother. So here the King James is using the word brother and mother, and standing without send unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren are without seek for thee. Okay, just to show us again that aside from people who were involved with Christ in ministry. Uh, he still had his own family life. He had brothers. He had sisters. Uh, the mother was still on the lookout for him. And even for Jesus on the cross, he still looked out for the mother. He didn't leave Mary to just survive on her own. On the cross, while he was dying, he said to John, John, thy mother. And he said to, the, to Mary, Mary, thy son. And from that moment, um, John Mary became the responsibility of John. Uh, if we don't pay attention, we may assume that Jesus was just going about ministry and um, didn't pay attention to family. Even though here, they actually, uh, they felt he's been talking, he's not been eating, he's been, so they wanted to call him out. That, see, let's talk to you. How, how are you doing this? And it's possible that your family members, they may not understand what God is doing with your life. And they may get agitated um, out of genuine affection for you. They may get agitated. The same thing also happened to Jesus. So it shouldn't come to us um, as a surprise. But you will always notice that situations that should provoke Jesus to anger, he always use it as an opportunity to teach people lessons about the kingdom of God. And so, in verse 33, the scripture says, And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked around about them, on, which, on them which sat about him, and said, Behold my mother and brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. So again, he took advantage of that situation to teach further about the principles of the kingdom of God. So he was showing that it's not about, it's no longer about a family um, blood association. But it's not about the kingdom of God. And that in God's kingdom, we don't relate people, 
with people based on whether we are from the same tribe, the same ethnic group, uh, the same family, and so on. What matters now is anybody who is doing the will of God, you must consider that person your brother, your sister, and accord that person the same love, the same respect, the same help that you will accord anybody that you consider to be your brother, your sister. So for, for us, you can see that we, are, we have a big family, okay? We have a big family as God's children. As many as are doing the will of God, they belong to the family of God, and we all belong uh, to the same family. All right, so um, then if we go to verse 10, if we go to verse 10 of chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, verse 10, um, we will see again another character of Christ. He says, and when he was alone, now the, 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 the background story is that Jesus had told them the parable of the sower. Okay, and he was done with that, with that parable. So what happened next? The scripture says, and when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked him, asked of him the parable, and he said unto them. Now look at it. He had told a parable, but they met him again privately, and then they asked him again about the parable. And he was patient enough to go through the parable again and then to now provide further details about the parable. Also note that he did not initiate the explanation of the parable until they asked him. And that means that when we don't understand something about Christ, we must go ahead and ask. He will provide us with the answer. You can see that this, you see, even though we can't see Jesus physically today, we often say that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But do we truly believe it? In the same way that anytime you look at scripture, you read about uh, Jesus being asked questions and responding. It's in the same way today that if you ask anything, if you read a Bible passage and say, Lord, I don't understand it, do you know he will explain it to you? He will find a way to give you understanding of that scripture. Because if he was physically here, that's what he's going to do. He took his time to explain again to the disciples. He had that kind of patience to explain to them again. He didn't get angry or irritated. That Where were you when I was talking the other time? You were not paying attention. <laughs> You know, so he took his time again and he explained. So we also can be rest assured that when we ask him questions, uh, Jesus will respond to questions. And many of his teachings that we benefit from today were actually product of questions that were asked Jesus. And he responded to them uh, and then they become a blessing to us today. So from verse 11, he just went ahead and began to explain to them once again the meaning of the parable. Uh, for those of us who are parents, who are teachers um, at various levels, we must also learn this. We must learn patience in teaching people, in bringing people to the knowledge of Christ. At times you might say things, you might teach things, you might need to go through it over and over again. Then you notice that he gave attention to both multitude and few people. Jesus didn't base is is Jesus isn't this kind of minister of God that he only deals with big multitude and he doesn't like dealing with small groups. So if you invite Jesus to a fellowship of three people to come and preach, he will be there. If you invite him to a fellowship of three hundred thousand. He will be there. He never related to people based on population. So few people came to him. He still responded to them. Just like the story of 
the woman by the well side. Jesus had just moved from a mighty crusade. But yet he had he gave attention to one single woman. You know, at times if care is not taken, we are waiting until when we have everybody before we give our best. God judges, God looks at the way we treat one person. Because in reality, the way you treat one person is the way you will treat one million. Because even if you are speaking to one million, you are actually speaking to one person. We must value one single soul. We must not value multitude. Our value of human being must not be based on multitudes, but on, on the value of one single soul. So Jesus could take his own time to talk to an individual and spend time with that person. Did you note that the book of Luke was written to one man? That book was, uh, uh, what is it called? Luke, Luke's follow-up to, uh, what is the name? Was writing to one of their uh, well-placed king. Let me just check uh, Luke chapter, Theophilus, yes. He wrote to Theophilus, you know. Can you imagine in, in Luke's attempt to preach the gospel clearly to one man, he wrote the book of Luke. He told him the entire story of Jesus. We, most people feel that the book of Luke actually covers more than any of the gospel. But it was written to, only, to one man. So you can see their own commitment to souls. Some people are waiting until they have crowd before they can give their best. But for these people, one single soul takes the best out of them. For Jesus, one single soul takes the best out of him. So the entire book of Luke, it always challenges me, the dedication that you could write that book just for one man, you know. So I, 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 you know, I just wonder at times the way we go about the gospel, um, the gospel today, the commitment to the gospel. If the entire book of Luke can be written just to a man for follow up, and he said he's just follow up. He had preached to Theophilus. He said he wants him to know more about the way, and all he will have to write is now the entire account of the life of Christ. It's quite, it's quite challenging, and that's the same way. Jesus himself operated. He gave attention to few. He gave attention to multitude. He did not discriminate. He didn't wait until he had um, eyes on him. If you look at Europe today and maybe um, some part of America and so on, most sporting activities, there are no crowd. And the players are still expected to give their best. Even without, without the crowd, they are still expected to give their best. You know, so let's have a proper valuation of people that we can treat a soul with utmost respect. The last, um, the last thing we will consider today is verse, uh, verse thirty-seven, verse thirty-seven of Mark chapter four, as we round up. Um, Verse 37 of Mark chapter 4. Now, that's a familiar story. It says, And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest not that thou that we perish. Now, now look at the scenario. One, he was tired. If we had checked this story in other, other uh, gospel, you see that he was actually tired and then he was sleeping. So there's nothing wrong to be tired. There's nothing wrong to sleep. Many of you do work that when you come back from work and so on, you, have, you are extremely tired, you want to sleep. It's okay to, it's okay to be tired. Uh, you may want to pray, but you are tired, you really want to sleep. You can sleep. Please rest very well. Jesus himself was tired. Uh, he was thirsty, uh, he wept, so he experienced fullness of 
humanity. If for you now for you to know how tired Jesus could be, it is not when you sleep that deep during a storm and you didn't wake up, it tells you how tired you could really be. You know, no matter how tired you are, if a vehicle is about to have an accident, you suddenly wake up and you feel um suddenly the sleep seems to be gone, and you are thinking of wow, how we were saved from that possible accident you know so it's okay to sleep but more important is i want us to know the words the disciples said to him they said don't you care that we perish don't you care that we perish you know if it were to be you and i that word will hurt us a people somebody that was a nobody that jesus picked them up from being fishers of men, he picked them up to become the friend of God, to, to receive power, to walk with him, to fellowship with him. He became responsible for their lives. How they eat, what they eat, what will come of their life became the responsibility of Jesus. Now, having done all of this, they could still say to him, because of one moment of trouble, you don't care about us. And you know this can happen in different aspects of life. Some of you are outside the country, and you have siblings that maybe you send money to from time to time, and they never feel you are doing enough. They will always tell you you don't even care about them. So understand that the same thing was said to Jesus, and don't walk yourself up. Don't kill yourself. Because people feel that you don't care about them. It is their perspective. It is not the reality. It is their, their perception. It is not the truth. Will you say that Jesus doesn't care about them? In fact, they said that you don't, don't you care that we perish? As in, does it not matter to you, Jesus, that we perish? Um, that's um, verse... 38, verse 38. I want to read that verse 38 uh, in various, in different translations so that we can just see what they said. Uh, verse 38, NIV puts it this way. Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Don't you care? Uh, New Living Translation says, Teacher, don't you care that we are going to drown? All right. Um, New King James says, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And the message, the message always has a way of saying things. Teacher, is it nothing to you that we are going down? <laughs> Is it nothing to you that we are going down? All right? So, they said this to Jesus. They felt this is the way Jesus was treating them. But that wasn't the truth. So, we could feel, people could say this to us. People could make us feel like you have not done enough. You really don't care. And you know that you have given your best. At times, people don't know that you impoverish yourself in order to help them. They don't even understand that. You know, they think that if you give to them, it means you have plenty. They don't know that you are making yourself poor in order for them to be rich. So people can feel this way and say this type kind of things to you. You must not allow it to disturb you. You must not allow it to affect you. The other way around also is that you also can feel this way towards God. If the disciple felt this way towards God, it's also possible that you feel this way. You, you almost feel like, God doesn't care, you know, and it's not true. But the interesting part is the response of Jesus. Verse 39, the scripture says, And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? Now, did you notice that he didn't try to say to them, 
Why will you think that I don't care about you? You know, if it were you and I, that's the issue we want to clear. That's why, that's why you see, we create problems for ourselves because we just want to deal with issues that we should not be dealing with. For you and I, you will want to be like, after everything I've done for you, you could still talk like this. Why would you even say that in the first place? Why would... No, I, I really want to know why you, you would even say that in the first place. And then we just waste time, waste our emotions, our energy fighting on things we ought not to fight over. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't address that statement. He knew he cared about them. That is, he doesn't need to prove any point to them. You see, as long as you know in your heart of heart that you have done your best, you do have nothing to prove again to anybody. Just, just leave the whole matter for God. Don't. Many times we are always trying to prove ourselves to people. We don't need it. Just do your best and leave the rest as they say. So Jesus did the same thing. He addressed the problem, but he didn't try to justify himself, to make them know that, oh, but I really care about you. You know, you just imagine if this is happening between spouses. Says, you don't care about me. And you are wondering, how could I have done all of this for this person? And then this person is still saying, I don't care about her or I don't care about him. You know, so if it happens to Jesus, it can happen uh, to any one of us. All right. This is where we are going to be stopping today by the grace uh, of God. We have been looking at the character of Jesus. There are so many things. If if we have time, we could continue uh, the entire book of Mark, and we will keep discovering the humanity of Jesus. So you might take time now that we have set it forth to read through any of the gospel and begin to note key things. You know, one of the things that blessed me so much in the life of Jesus is the way he prayed. John chapter 17. That John chapter 17 is classic for prayer. As in, nobody can pray better than John chapter 17. It was simply a conversation with God. And that is the way Jesus wants us to pray. You know? So I looked at that prayer. I looked at the, the context, the, the workings of that prayer, the arrangement, how he was going about it. He was just having a conversation with God. Because at times when they say he wakes up in the morning to pray, you are wondering what exactly does Jesus pray about? It's a conversation. We can simply have conversation uh, with God and talk to him. Then you have heard some things that people say very often that, that is far from scripture. I don't know, maybe you have also heard. They say that prayer is a two-way thing. When you talk to God, you listen to him, he also talks to you. Actually, that's not true. And you won't find any of that even in the life of Jesus. Jesus would pray and God was not speaking to him at the point of prayer. Even when he said, uh, Father, Father, take this cup away from me. God didn't respond. There was no response at that moment. You know, we talk to God, we, we express our heart. If He says, your father which seeth in secret will answer you openly. So it means what we have prayed about, it's not immediate that God will be speaking to us. God, of course, can speak to you while you are praying. But it's not often the practice. So just pray your prayer. If you like, you can keep quiet and say you want to hear God. That's not the way God speaks. When you pick your Bible, God will speak to you. God will speak to you. You may be washing clothes, you may be doing chores, you may be doing things, driving, and so on. And then God begins to say some certain things to you. It may be things you've prayed for maybe four, three weeks ago, uh, and so on. It could even be something you prayed about in the morning. You know, so as we look at Jesus, he helps us to know how to conduct our lives because he's the standard. He's the only example that God has set for us. So we will stop here today by the grace of God and trust that next time uh, God will be introducing us uh, to another dimension in Christ, to another dimension in his word. So I feel that we should just spend some time uh, and talk to God, particularly the fact that we are rounding up this topic today, that um, this life, this character, God will cause it to grow also in you. Let's just take some moment to speak to God in whatever way um, that he has spoken to us. God, that God will give us the wisdom to live 
like Christ lived, to handle situations the way he did, to address issues in our lives the way he did. To be able to respond like him. That our life will reflect his character, it will reflect his glory. Many of the things that trouble our heart, if we only see Jesus, they become nothing to us. Many of the things people say to you that get you worked up, you will discover that they are said far worse than to Jesus. And he handled it in a way that didn't cause him any trouble. Ask that God will open your eyes further to the character of Jesus. God will reveal his son to you. Ask that Christ be formed in you. Paul said it pleases God to reveal Christ in him that he might preach him. Ask also that Christ will be formed also in you. Jesus said, learn of me and you will find rest for your soul. That's why we are learning from him. The more we know Jesus, the more rest we have for our soul. Ask that you will know him more and you will experience his rest. That's why he could sleep in the storm. Why we are worried and afraid of perishing. Jesus could sleep in the storm. Ask that you will rest. The situations in your life that are causing you restlessness. Ask that God will reveal Christ to you in that situation. So that you will have rest. You will have rest concerning that matter. You will have rest concerning that issue. As from now, people will wonder at your character. They will begin to ask you, how come you are, your character is, is so wonderful like this? People, may people see the character of Christ in our lives. Lord, let me not be the preacher of your word alone, but the doer of your word. Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. All of these brethren, they, they wanted to know him. Christians were called Christian first in Antioch. Why? Because their character reflects that of Christ. Christians, Christ-like people, people with the character of Christ. May we also be like that. May we, be, may we become true Christians. Not just Christians by paper classification, but by our lives, may we reflect the life, light of God. Let's begin to thank God for how he has taken us through this series. This is the third and the last part of this series, except if he pleases the Lord and he wants us to revisit it. But just thank him for the way he has spoken to us, that the word he has sown into your heart will not be in vain. It will produce the desired fruit. Let's thank him for his mercy. Let's round up our prayers. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed.